Welcome to Exploring the Parables of Jesus, Session 4. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, as we continue to explore the parables of Jesus, we'll be looking at the parables and looking at them in their context, and at the same time trying to understand why did the author choose to put this particular story at this particular point in his gospel? Which, of course, brings us back to the idea well, how did the Gospels develop? Actually, we've said this several times. The Gospels were not written until about 30, 35 years, the first one marked, 30, 35 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And within that time, the community came together. They shared what they had learned about Jesus, learned from Jesus. And so they shared this with each other they told the stories. They separated them. Someone might say, well, you know, I heard this story from Jesus. Or this little parable Jesus told. They applied them in small ways to things happening in their own community. Remember Jesus said this. Remember Jesus gave us this parable. And so what happens is the parables themselves, they begin to develop meaning that perhaps there were some parts in the parables that Jesus really didn't say, but they fit in a context. They answer a question that people are asking at the time that the Gospels were written or at the time the parables were developing and the Gospels were developing. So as a result, for instance, we have Mark's Gospel 30, 35 years after Jesus. We have the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, more than 50 years after Jesus. And then, of course, the Gospel of John, up to about the year 90 to 100. And we see all of this, we say, over that period of time, Jesus' disciples shared the message. They were faithful to the message, but at the same time, there were things happening within their communities that were causing them to write the message in answer to questions that were happening, the issues that were taking place within their own communities. So that's what we'll be doing now. We'll be looking at the parables, but saying, well, why did the authors choose to put these parables in this particular place? And also, what does the place that they were put into tell us about the parables themselves? So we'll look at the parables now. And as we go through it, we'll be reading through the parables from the scriptures, seeing how they were written, seeing what the disciples, the followers of Jesus, the writers of the Gospels told us. So we'll begin first with the story of workers in the vineyard. What we're talking about mainly during this particular session is the grace of the reign of God. What I mean by that, the blessings of the reign of God, how the reign of God is a blessing for the people, calling them to change their life and to reflect Jesus by their life. When Jesus told a parable, gave a parable, Jesus wasn't just telling a nice story. Jesus was saying, this is how you should live in the kingdom, the reign of God. And so this is what the story is saying. And so we'll read the story and apply it now to its context and to what it meant to the early disciples. So we have the workers in your vineyard. That's one of the stories. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. A landowner. So right away, Jesus brings the story into the context of the lives of those that he's speaking to. And also is developed in time in the lives of those Jesus is speaking to. 
So Jesus goes out, it says, the landowner, and after agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. The vineyard, of course, is the world. Going out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you too go into my vineyard and I will give you what is just. So they went off and he went out again about noon. What he said, for instance, in the first one, the first group that he hired, he says, I'll give you what the daily wage is. The second group he meets, he says, I'll give you whatever is just. And so as he went out again around noon and three o'clock in the afternoon and did likewise, he went out about five o'clock and found others still standing around and said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last ones worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who bore the day's burden and the heat. He said to one of them in reply, my friend, I'm not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What I wish to give this last one, if I wish to give them the same as you, am I free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? And then it says, thus the last shall be first and the first will be last. The idea behind that parable, Jesus is giving us an attitude of being concerned for the poor, concerned for the workers. He's realizing they've been out there all day. And that's part of the background of the story. And they're going to work one hour. And the thinking is, well, if they go home with an hour's wage, that's not very much. It's not going to really be enough to sustain their light living. So the owner is very generous now. And he's really saying, I, I'm no longer working on that justice image of giving what is just here and there. I'm being generous. And don't be envious because I am generous. And he's saying to the early workers, I give you what I promised to give you. You, you can't complain. You were willing to go and work for that. But then these others, they come at the last hour, but they get as much as you do. Of course, right away, we get the idea of that particular parable. What it's really saying to us is, even if a person at the last hour turns to Jesus, at last hour before they die, they're going to be open and able to receive the full reward that those who worked all day. And this story comes from Matthew's gospel. And getting a background of Matthew's gospel, Matthew's gospel is written for converts from Judaism. And there's some in Judaism who are saying, well, we see the Gentiles coming into the faith. It's not fair that they should be treated equally. Our faith goes all the way back to Abraham. We worked all day as a group, as a community. And what Jesus is saying in this parable, it doesn't matter when you receive the faith as a group, as a community. It's how you live the faith. And then we read a little commentary actually from Matthew. He writes at the end of the story, are you envious, etc. Thus the last will be first and the first will be last. Commentators believe that Matthew probably 
added this later on because it appears earlier in Matthew's gospel. It's as though he took it from something that was another story and then decided, well, I'll apply, apply it here. But in reality, it really doesn't have that much to do with the story. So it's a commentary by Matthew. The real commentary is God is generous, even to those who come last. It's the grace of the kingdom of God at work. And so we look at that and what it's really saying to us is don't think the way the world thinks. Think the way God thinks and realize God is generous and we should rejoice that God is generous. And that's the message of the parable. How does Jesus tell us that he doesn't stop and say, well, let me tell you, God is generous. No, he tells a story. He lets the people absorb the message. And we continue now with the another story, a story from Jesus, another parable. So in that parable now, we have a parable, what's called the parable of the two sons. So Jesus continues to teach about the grace of the reign of God. He says to the people gathered, what is your opinion? He's really talking to the Pharisees. A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go out and work in the vineyard. He said to him in reply, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave him the same order. He said in reply, yes, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They answered the first. Jesus said to them, amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. And so he's telling them that really just saying I'm going to be God's law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other religious leaders, they committed themselves to God by word, but they didn't carry it out. They didn't live as they should have lived. They were not images of God in the sense that they were following God's message. Who were following God's message? The sinners. They needed money for sustenance. They seemed to be sinners in the world, tax collectors. And so what Jesus is saying, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the one we look down upon, they could be the ones who are really going to share in God's reward. And so the story of the two sons. Now, one of the interesting things, why did Jesus say, what's the context for this? Well, the context really is about John the Baptist. At least that's one of the ideas. So Jesus before this, says, well, what, let's talk about John the Baptist. Where was he from? He's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees who refused to accept John. Was it from heaven or from human origin? Uh, and they were caught. If we say from heaven, if his message from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we fear the crowd, for they all regarded John as a prophet. So they couldn't say he was human, his message. So they said to Jesus in reply, we do not know. He himself said to them, neither shall I tell you by what authority I do these things. That's the context of the two sons. He's saying, you're refusing to listen. You're like the son who is saying, I'll go out and do it, but never does it. Later on, he ends that parable with the words, when John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your mind and believe in him. The purpose of the parable is to tell us the two sons, they refused to listen to bad ones, Pharisees, what they saw as the bad ones were really the good ones in that story. And so what Jesus is simply saying is commit yourself, but carry out what you commit. 
the grace of the parables, the grace of the reign of God is saying, live in God's presence as one of the community of the reign of God. It's not something Jesus can define. He can't say, well, one has to be good, the other bad. It's too simple. But he's really saying, carry out the promises you make to God. And then to realize God's going to give you insight to see God working through someone like John the Baptist. So that would be one idea then. Then we come to another one, the now Luke Star Gospel. We'll go to Luke's Gospel. And in Luke's Gospel, we read the story of the idea of forgiveness that God is giving us again. God's always speaking about forgiveness, Jesus. So we have in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 39. So here's the context. A Pharisee invited Jesus to dine with him. And Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. Now there was a sinful woman in the city who learned that Jesus was at table in the house of the Pharisee. Bringing a flask of ointment, she stood behind Jesus and weeping, began to bathe and wash his feet. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them. When the Pharisees saw this, they were saying to themselves, if this man is a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is. Jesus said to them in reply, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so he tells them that I came and you didn't wash my feet. That was a custom in those days. In those days, when a traveler came, the host would have a slave wash his feet because many wore sandals, very dusty. And so they would recline, head towards the front. They didn't have chairs, and their feet towards the back. And a slave would come and wash their feet. So he talks about that. He turns to the woman, and he says to her, you did not give me a kiss. He talks to the other, excuse me, the Pharisees about the woman. You did not give me a kiss when I came in. You didn't anoint my feet. But the one whom little is forgiven loves little. That's a parable. The parable is saying, to whom little is given, loves little. So God is giving them little love to the Pharisees because, well, they don't love enough. They don't feel like they've been forgiven. But the one whom little is forgiven, but now he says, the others at table who are talking about this. What about this woman? So that's the story that Jesus wants to share here with the idea that they're really sharing the story of someone who is truly forgiven. So who is forgiven little is going to be the one who will be given, who will be loved greatly. Then we come to another story. In Luke, again, Luke 18, 9 to 14. And in this story, Jesus is going to be speaking about a Pharisee and a publican. Again, to teach a message. He's teaching a message that some believe the kingdom, the reign of God, is given to people because they follow the law. Again, Matt Luke, he's in the midst of a turmoil. He's saying what Jesus gave us is a law of love, a law of faith. It's not a law that says, follow the rules. And so he wants to tell a story about that. So he wants to tell us about not, the, not following the rules. Excuse me. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collectors. So Jesus addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Context. They were convinced of their own righteousness. I am a good person. Now comes the reason. Two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a tax collector. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself. Oh God, 
I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on my whole income. But the tax collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The idea again behind that particular parable is the idea that the Pharisee, he comes, he's saying, look, I, I kept all the laws. In fact, I even did better. I not only kept them, I did things I didn't have to do. Usually they have to fast once a week. He fasted twice a week. And we look at all the things he did. He paid tithes, tithes on all his income. They didn't have to pay tithes on all their income, but he did. So he's telling God, God, look at me. I'm pretty good. And God is saying, but that tax collector in the past, he gave nothing to God. He bowed his head and simply said, God, be good to me, a sinner. And so we look at that, and this is what the grace of the kingdom is. To really realize, even after we do everything great with our life, God still doesn't owe us anything. We are simply rewarded because God chooses to reward us. And that's the idea behind that. It's God's choosing that really makes us justified. So he goes home justified. It was the other one who was telling God, I'm such a good person. I deserve reward, but not the public. It's a message that Jesus is saying, where will I find faith on earth? It's in that context. And he's saying faith on earth is in the person who is humble. And it talks about the humility that Jesus is looking. It's not someone who keeps the law. Luke was one who was writing for Gentiles and saying, you're not asked to keep the law of Moses. You're asked to follow the law, law of love given by Jesus. Again, how do we explain the grace of the reign of God? The best way to do it is to tell a story. So he goes home justified, it says. Again, in here in verse 14, it says he went home justified, not the former. Again, that quote comes up. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That part of the story was probably added by the one who told the story originally. So it wasn't something that Jesus most likely said, but that was the idea of the application. Actually, it fits even better here. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. It's a good summary of the parable. And then we go now back to Matthew. And in Matthew, we have the story of the lost sheep. So he's talking about the lost sheep. What he begins, the context, see one of these little ones, one of these children. They're very important in God's eyes. And so he says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly father. Now he asked them to make it to, to share their judgment on this story. What is your opinion? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety nine in the hills and go in search of the stray? And if he finds it, and then I say to you, he rejoices more over it than over the 99 that did not stray. In just the same way, it is not the will of God in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. He's saying everybody's dignified. Everybody has a dignity. And God is as concerned about them. God doesn't say, well, it's only a few people who are sinners. That that still hurts God. 
God wants everyone to be saved. And so we see that and he's telling it in story form. And so when he does it that way, he's talking about the lost sheep, the dignity of the human being that the shepherd would leave the others in the desert. What happens with the lost sheep back in those days? When a sheep doesn't recognize, it's probably eating the grass, suddenly realizes the flock is no longer with it. And you would think the sheep now would go running around to find the flock, but sheep didn't do that apparently. Once they realized their flock wasn't around, they wouldn't know what to do. They were confused. They would lay down and stay where they were. And so the shepherd has to go and find the sheep. And there's times in the life when sinners are lost, they're not connected. Jesus has to go and find them. That person, the sinner, has dignity. And so how do you say that in the definition? It's easier to say it in a story. And that story developed on down through the ages. We go to Luke, and we find out that Luke tells a story of the lost sheep. And in Luke's gospel, the lost sheep is taken and brought back. Everybody rejoices. Luke emphasizes the rejoicing. They're all rejoicing because the sheep has been returned. And that's again the idea. The idea is that Jesus gives us a community, a community that rejoices, following upon the same idea as the lost sheep is the idea of a lost coin. The lost coin talks about a woman who has 10 coins, which says she's poor, actually. And she lost one. And she searches her house till she finds it. Everybody gets involved in this. They're all concerned. It's a community concern. And she finally founds it, finds it, and she rejoices. And everyone rejoices with her. Again, the idea behind that parable, the reign of God is a community that rejoices with the good of another. And so Jesus is sharing a story. Luke's stories are much more intimate in the sense that they're much more down to earth, much more concerned with the people, much more show love for people. So Jesus uses those parables we find them in Luke's gospel. And then we find a really wonderful story in Luke's gospel. It's the story that many of us know as the prodigal son. But it's also called the lost son. So in chapter 15 in Luke's gospel, he tells about the story of the lost, the prodigal son. So it's really called the lost son by some. So when Jesus does that in Luke's gospel, he's sharing with us a very intimate story. And it's really perfect as far as human nature goes. So here's how the story goes. Jesus says, a man had two sons. The younger said to his father, father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. In those days, everybody knew how much they were going to get. It was given, it was presumed. They worked and they shared in their families, but they knew they had some inheritance. So the father divided the property between them. What the son is really saying is, father, I'm going to cut myself off from my family. I want to be on my own. And so today we read the story, we see it simply as the son asking for the inheritance. But in Jesus' day, the story is saying he's really cutting himself off from the family. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. That's as low as he could fall. Swine were the lowest of animals in the minds of the Jewish people. 
the idea of tending pigs. Tending the pigs was saying, I have really fallen very far. And he longed to eat the fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Not only did he fall that far, tend the swine, he wanted to eat the food of the swine, of the pigs. That's really low. So the author, Jesus, as he tells this story, is saying, this is the kingdom of God, the reign of God. What happened? The son cut himself off from the reign of God. But all is not ended. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough to eat? But here am I dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. So now he's repenting. He's going to go back to his father. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. He's already made his decision. He's already made the decision that he's going home, going back to his family, but not as a family member, as a hired worker. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. God. One of the things about the story is that there's three characters in it. We have the son who takes the inheritance and leaves and sins. We have the elder son who refuses to go into the celebration. And we have the father, the father who really reflects God's love. So the father looks out with compassion. He caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, undignified. A father would never do that. The head of the household was the head of the household. He was like a king. And yet he runs to his son. He gives us, sets aside his own dignity. Jesus set aside his own dignity in becoming human for us. He embraced his son and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. So right away, he's ready to say, I'm repentant. Not only am I repentant, I'm willing to become now one of your slaves, one of your servants. I know you treat them well. Of course, we learned that earlier in the story. But the idea is, Sam, I want you to take me on as a hired hand. But he really can't stop thinking of his father as a father. He doesn't say, I want you to take me on as my father, uh, hired hand. He begins by saying, father. He still calls him father. Luke, Jesus, can also share this in their story. It's purposely, purposely put in there. It's part of the story, getting behind the story and seeing the compassion and love of God. I no longer deserve to be called your son, but he can't help calling his father, father. But his father ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The father doesn't even let him finish. He stops him. You're repentant, you said enough, I accept you. And what does he do? He doesn't just say, Okay, you can work as a hired hand. We know that. But what he's saying is come back into the family. What does he do? He puts on the finest robe, dignity. He gives him dignity. That's a sign of dignity in those days. Sandals on his feet. The idea that he's someone special. It's actually a sign of authority. Then take the fatted calf and slaughter it. He's not just welcome back into the family. He's welcome to the family table. Again, back in Jesus' days, being welcome to the family table, that was something really important. 
really dignified. It's the biggest <laughs> way of dignifying someone was to bring them to the family table. Then let us celebrate with a feast. The story, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. They're all brought back. And the writers, they probably passed these stories on from one to another. But now Luke, he starts to put these stories into place. The story of the lost son is found only in Luke's gospel. And we look at that, we say, Luke possibly heard it from his own community. They passed this on to show the great love of God. Not only does God forgive, God forgets. God makes his son a member of the family. And the reason he's celebrating, because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. God, Jesus, sees sin as death. He wants us, no matter what we've done with our life, to really come back. He was lost and has been found. And so the losing was inside himself. And so the son now has been found. He found himself again. Realized that he really belonged somewhere in the presence of the father. And the celebration began. So killing the fatted calf, that was significant, of course. You know, it's brought out, we, we right away when we read the story, we know that that means it was something special. Now, the older son had been out in the field. And on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry. And when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, look, all these years I served you and not once did I disobey your orders? Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up the property with prostitutes, for him, you slaughter the fatted calf. The compassionate father, the loving father. His son refused to come in. The father doesn't rest there. He goes out to him. The idea God goes out to those who are obstinate. It doesn't really say the son is a sinner. He's done everything perfectly. He's fulfilled all the rules. But that's the problem. He fulfilled the rules, but he was nothing like the father. In fact, he didn't even say my brother. He said to his father, that son of yours. He couldn't bring himself to say, my brother has returned. And as the story then says, he said to them, Father, my son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The lost sheep puts him over his shoulders and takes him home back to the community. Actually, the elder son reflects the Pharisees and others. They're very strict in the way they practice the rules. They're faithful to the law of Moses, but they lack the spirit of Jesus. And that's what Luke is trying to say. Luke is up against this in his daily life. As we look at the letters of Paul, we find an image of what Luke is going through trying to tell the new converse to Christ that it's faith in Christ and not the following of the Mosaic law that is going to bring them salvation, that Christ brought us a new way of living. He put new wine into new wineskins. And so what's being said here is that he's inviting the elder son back. Significantly in the story, it doesn't tell us what the elder son did. 
it doesn't have that kind of an ending. It doesn't say, well, the father didn't convince the elder son. It simply says the father's last words that uh, because now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. So we see how Jesus is saying to us through the parables and how the writers, the gospel writers, captured the spirit of what Jesus was saying in the parables. The parables are really a wonderful way for us to say, well, how do I imitate Christ? The parables. The parables tell us how to be more like Christ, how to be a person like Christ. And so we have another story. A story of a wedding feast. Actually, it's told in two parts. Well, we have, first of all, in Matthew. It's in chapter 22. In chapter 22 in, in Ma Matthew, we have the story of a man who is celebrating. Celebrating a wedding. And so it's, again, a parable, a story. So Jesus spoke to them of many parables. So Jesus speaking to the crowd. The crowd is there, and they heard the parables that Jesus was preaching. And they were attempting to arrest Jesus, but they were afraid of the crowd. That's how Jesus speaks again to them in parables. It doesn't, Jesus doesn't have fear that it shuts him up. He keeps right on talking. He said, the kingdom of heaven may be likened to. He doesn't say it is. It's like. Very often, Jesus, again, will tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. But also in these parables, he's saying, look at the grace of God working through them, but also look at the challenge of God. So he dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time, he sent other servants saying, tell those invited, behold, I have prepared my banquet my calves and fatted cattle are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burn their city. Then he said to his servants, the feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out therefore into the main roads and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found bad and good alike. And the hall was filled with guests. So the idea being, that now everybody had come. But then what happens in Matthew's gospel, God acts with vengeance in a sense. God destroys and kills them like a king would do, being angry with the crowd. Luke will speak a little more politely about this when we take a look at the way Luke tells this story. And then there's another story attached, actually a parable attached right to this parable by Matthew. When the king came in to meet the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in a wedding garment. He said to him, my friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he was reduced to silence. Then the king said to his attendants, bind his hands and feet and cast him into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Again, a commentary. But the idea behind that is that just because we are invited to share in God's goodness, God's reign, it doesn't mean we are automatically good people. We have to wear a wedding garment. We are like the son who says, yes, I will go into the, into the field. And so we have that challenge. Are we going to say yes or no? Are we going to do it or not? And so what happens here, the man came to the feast, but he didn't have a wedding garment. 
he wasn't prepared. So just because he was invited and came does not mean he was accepted because he didn't join in the feast. And so that's what's being said that when we commit ourselves, we have to join in the feast. So that's part of that story. So then we go now to the idea of Luke. How did Luke tell the story? So we'll tell Luke 14. So the parable of the great feast. So we're hearing about the feast. So Jesus saying, blessed is the one who will dine in the kingdom of God. So now the king, and Matthew talks about a king who gave a great feast. In this story, blessed is the one who will dine in the kingdom. Here's what Jesus says. A man gave a great dinner in which he invited many. When the time came for the dinner, he dispatched his servants to say to the invited, come, everything is now ready. But one by one, they began to excuse themselves. The first said to him, I have purchased a field and must go to examine it. I ask you, consider me excused. And another said, I have purchased five yoke of oxen and am on my way to evaluate them. I ask you, consider me excused. And another said, I've just married a woman. And therefore, I cannot come. The servant went and reported this to his master. Then the master of the house, in a rage, commanded his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town, and bring in here the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. The servant reported, Sir, your orders have been carried out, and still there is room. The master then ordered the servant, go out into the highways and hedgewoods and bring people in that my home may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. Again, it's a warning. Luke tells a little different way. He gets more personal in a sense. He talks about why people aren't coming. Each one gives an excuse. We don't find those excuses in Matthew's gospel. In Luke's gospel, there's no talk about the king sending out and destroying everybody. This is a man who is having a feast. And he becomes angry. He invites everybody, the poor, those who are crippled. What is selling us, of course, obviously, Jesus comes for all people. But then it still wasn't filled. And it seems what Luke is saying here Go out and invite others, the Gentiles, those who are not Jewish. And so the message there in Luke's gospel, again, Luke reaching out beyond Judaism. Did Jesus come to save all people or just the Jews? He came to save all people. That's what Luke is saying. And so the parable that Luke gives is the parable of a great feast. Again, all of these messages, these parables, they were actually, in many ways, just told. And it's up to the gospel writer to put them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, put them into a place where it brings out their message for those who are reading the gospels and trying to understand Jesus. This is the way Jesus thinks. This is the reign of God, the presence of Jesus. This is the mind of Jesus at work. And so the parables do that. We sometimes read a parable, we get the message, but the real idea behind them also is saying, it's sharing with us in a deeper way, the mind of Jesus. Each story comes from the heart of Jesus and says, this is how I would like you to act in the reign of God. And it says, the reign of God is a reflection of the grace of God in our life. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, 
The word of Christ instruct me. The shelter of Christ protect me. The hand of Christ hold me. And the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me. The sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.